headsets off so that I can hear everybody better. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Welcome to um, the One O'Clock Live. Uh, my name is Jazz. I'm Nat. And today we're going to be talking about emotional regulation and answering some questions. Um, and this is the this is Aropia Foundation. For those who don't know, um, we're a mental health well-being organization um, whose uh, roles on the Isle of Wight is to support people who uh, empower people to um, make changes to their, their mental well-being and see uh, mental health as something that is um, that can be worked on and, and can be um, adapted and managed. Um, of course, experience here. And uh, we will pull most of our information and most of our resources from our own personal lived experience. Um, we don't come from a professional as in a, um, a medical professional or a clinical professional background. Um, so I think that's really important that we um, say that when we're answering any questions that you may have or any questions that we have uh, preloaded from um, previous lives or question and answers um, that, that we're answering from our own personal perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's kind of what we're doing on our lives today. I will be with you for the next hour. So what's your experience now with uh, emotional regulation before we get started? Well, I think my emotional regulation is definitely centered. I've, as I've got older, I've discovered that it's around stress. Mm. So that is my main trigger. That is what sets me off. That that affects my OCD. For those of you guys who haven't met me, I have an OCD. So this is what um, has definitely set my moods to go up and down. You know, we can all, I think, agree with that, can't we? Yeah. I think, um, sorry, um, you might see me put my headphones on, um, oh, following this around. You might see me put my headphones on a couple of times as I'm trying to check sound, uh, cause we're, we're trying these brand new microphones today, aren't we? So, mm. um, if you see, if you hear us just kind of go off on the side and, um, lose our microphones, we're just trying to figure out how to use these. Um, in terms of, yeah, emotional regulation for me, um, I was quite a, a, a deregulated person, very quick to go off, um, uh, up and down in my mood that was me personally I was quite prone to just um one minute being really low and the next minute being really excited about something and the, my problem was that I didn't get a balance mm. I'd gone from like uh, one to straight to the opposite yeah um and it, it does it does create that kind of inconsistency that made me tired it made me fatigued um, I then struggled with things like interpersonal relationships and stuff like that as, as a result um, because my boundaries were slipping, my emotions were taking over from my logic, these kind of things. Yeah. And I think sometimes when you're in that kind of mood, your emotion is is almost controlling you rather than the other way around, aren't you? So, of course, it affects like every aspect of your life. Yeah. It's one of those things that, you know, if you, if you um, have your mood in check, um, if you if you're regulating it, mm. even even when you're perfectly regulated in your mood all the time, which I don't think many people can be can say that they've always been regulated in their no. mood all the time. Um, it it's something that when you are regulated, you're still having bad moments that are going to pull you out of that regulation and pull you um, um, into into you know moods, different moods, sadness, happiness, you know, overjoy, mm. and the opposite, depression and things like that. Um, but when you naturally struggle with or you're going through mental health where you do struggle with the way you, to regulate your mood it can then really um affect other areas of our lives yeah definitely. and and um it can be so much more difficult to value the importance of having that regulation having that balance i think um emotional regulation is such an important subject to look mm -hmm. at because i think it is almost i you know i don't want to put too much emphasis on it but it's almost to all of our mental mm. um learning how to regulate it it sounds really easy doesn't it but it's not and it takes work and it takes daily work as well and sometimes mm. i've found especially for me that um when i think that i'm fine and i'm not putting the work in that's when it tends to slip and i tend to crash yeah. so when you think you're not having to put the work in you have to put the work in still. Yeah, you um, it, it's a bit of a trickster, isn't it? When you when you feel you're regulated, you're more level headed. You're getting on with your day, and then you think, okay, I'm regulated now. I don't need to use my tools anymore yeah. because I've I'm the master of my own well being. And yeah. then you stop doing your tools, 
and it's going well, it's going fine. Things are starting to go smooth and then suddenly things crash again and exactly. you go, well, why? Why? I'm yeah. perfectly regulated now. And then yeah. you realise, ah, oh, I haven't been using my tools again. I haven't been um, uh, focusing on areas that I should be focusing. I've been, um, one of my ones was always I dropped boundaries. Yeah. So if something was really unhealthy for me or I was in a, in a relationship or a friendship that wasn't good for me, for example, um, I would... I would loosen my boundaries. I would let more things in. Mm. But more for myself, my own boundaries and other people's boundaries. And put up with more. Yeah. And, and um, I think it, it, there's a lot of things that affect, um, are affected by emotional regulation that, just, that aren't just our mood. Mm. Um, and I think we'll go more into that as we, as we go along this live. So that was that was kind of the, the any kind of the kind of intro with emotional regulation. Please, if you've got any questions about emotional regulation, please answer them. Uh, ask questions below, and also we've got questions that are coming up on the screen. Um, uh, please feel to, free to bring in your own um, points and your own answers to the questions and your experiences. I think it's so important that we have an open discussion about these things, and mm. um, we uh, showcase. Others, because I think one thing about Isoropia is that we always value the power of connecting with others and like-minded experiences. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that power of that connection that comes with um, talking about things openly. Obviously, if you don't feel comfortable on a public access page like this, uh, please feel free to um, let us know afterwards or send us a message or something like that. Um, however, if you do feel comfortable, please feel free to um, jump on. It's and, always uh, bring good what to listen to other people's solutions yeah, as well, or, isn't it? You know, we can just listen. Now, these these lives are utilised however you'd like to utilise them. Mm. So, with that being in mind, uh, I know we do have a comment. Just go on to the first question. Um, actually, hang on, we do have a comment. Here it is. So, this is from um, Megan. Hi, Megan. Hope you're well. I always found that my mood was hard to regulate until I was able to understand my emotions and why they led to my actions and reactions. I think it's very hard to control until we understand it. It's a huge one. Mm. It's a really good one, Meg. Um, it, because self-awareness, as you know, Meg, is the key to nearly everything, isn't it? And if we can understand our triggers, um, which lead to our reactions and our emotions and start identifying them, then we can either remove the trigger um, if it's not possible to remove the trigger, which I know it isn't always, mm. we can then start changing maybe the evaluation process, which then leads to the emotions or the reaction and or react differently. Mm. It, and um, exactly what you said, I, I definitely agree. It's if you don't, if you're not understanding something, if you're not really kind of gra gra grasping or uh, mm. getting what's going on or why you might be feeling that way, or at least what's causing it. Um, it is it's extremely hard to fight, uh, get combat it, or to do work on it. So I think yeah, mm. the awareness side of it is so important, and and having um, that non judgmental awareness as well. Oh, Sometimes absolutely. Sometimes the first thing we can do is um, when we become aware of something, we can almost guilt ourselves into trying to. We, uh, uh, I mean, it's different for everyone. In my experience, I used to guilt myself into trying. I thought more guilt I put on myself, mm -hmm. the more I'll work to fix myself okay that was my mentality it was like um you do that a lot some people do that with perfectionism as well yeah, yeah you know you go i'm not doing it well enough i'm not doing it well enough i need to fix this i'm bad i'm defective and you'd get into that state of like negative self-talk yeah um and i used that to try and fuel me but actually it didn't fuel me at all it drained me if anything yeah um and having that awareness Uh, is that we're freezing a couple of times on the screen um if that does happen um i will try my best to get us back again i know that we've been having some technical issues um we'll go on to the next question and hopefully we'll be um our internet's just come back again which is good um the first question we've got is uh, why is regulating mood so important why is regulating mood so important well, we kind of covered it in the intro, didn't we? Because yeah. um, if you don't regulate your mood, then um, your mood is going to control your life, mm. basically. Mm. Um, I know that sounds quite strict, but it, it, that essentially is it, isn't it? Mm. Um, I think, you know, we describe it usually as like this up and down, going up and down. Um, 
as you said, you were in that situation before, haven't you? Just moves yeah. going from one thing to the next. You don't know whether you're coming or going mm. when you're in, the, in, in that cycle. And um, I think one thing that's like really important to discuss with regulating mood being up and down is the fact that it's all of these moods are natural. Mm. They make us humans, don't they? Yeah. We need to have these moods. We need to have these emotions. Like essentially they were built around survival skills mm. and we've evolved with those emotions. However, um, how we, how long we stay in the emotion obviously has a massive impact on our mental health. So for example, sadness, um, mm. if we then stay in it for a long time, sadness is a completely healthy emotion. Mm. If you stay in it a long time, it may link to depression. Yeah. And, um, regulating mood helps to have a healthier more positive view on emotions altogether yeah like um some moods that are often deregulated such as anxiety um obviously you're, you're kind of high and low moods but also um anger is another one that was really really uh, when it comes to dysregulation um anger is actually a really healthy emotion yeah and it's something that is can be such a powerful tool um, however, when it's deregulated, it can we can really feel that it's a negative emotion and it's something that's unhealthy. Um, it's how you use yeah. that anger, isn't it? Because mm. healthy anger, to be angry that um, your needs have not been met um, it is a defense mechanism, isn't it? It, it? It's good for you. It's so that you can set boundaries mm. and you can set routines and make sure that other people don't hurt you. However, if your anger then turns into you being violent mm. or yeah. um, losing your temper, say with people at work mm. or your boss or anything like that, you're going to lose your job. It's going to have a massive impact on how much money you earn. You're going to mm. have to go, do you know what I mean? It just links. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, uh, there is a, um, an element to um, the status quo or social expectations that come with regulating mood. And it can affect things like our, you know, it can directly affect our finances in terms of employment and things like that. Yeah. But also uh, interpersonal relationships yeah. um, and um, it, or even down to the way we communicate our needs across to healthcare professionals or for people who, um, you know, need to get be assertive mm. about something. Like the amount of times that I've been, when I was, I wasn't well and I was um, on the phone to like the job center or the council or something like that that would get me quite emotional quite quickly because it can take a long time and mm -hmm. things like that um i would find myself being quite deregulated and actually not getting across my point not yeah. getting across my needs because my emotions clouded my logical thinking and yeah. i just kind of went yeah. um and it it doesn't mean it's a bad thing it's something that can be worked on mm. and um it's an emotional, we, we get emotional and we have these uh, regulated moments, but regulating it really help. Having that regulation in your mood really does help to get you, just get your needs met in general, to communicate. Um, and, and as you said, to kind of have that healthy balance of emotions and things like that. And going back to what mm. Meg, Meg said um, originally, which I think is really important, is just like the awareness and being able to recognise when you're going to get into one mm. of those moods is just really important. I'm, I mean, we quite often do this thing, like at the beginning of a workshop, um, especially when we do the foundation course, mm. which is how are you feeling like right now, mm. like your anxiety levels. And um, I did it actually with Charlie a little while ago before a workshop, and I said I'm really anxious. I, I, I don't know why I'm just really, really anxious. Mm. I'd say about eight or nine out of ten. And just naming it brought the power of that emotion down already, just saying yeah. it out loud. And Charlie said to me, "What? What? why do you think you're anxious? Like, what? what's different from usual? Did you get enough sleep, blah, blah, blah? And we just talked around it. And I said, I saw a car accident on the way to work and it was right outside of school and there were children on a school bus. And I didn't, I'd only seen it for like a split second while I was driving past mm. it but I didn't realize that it set my anxiety and my OCD levels and as soon as I was aware of that I was like that's what it is I can name it mm. it's almost like bring it out into the open and then my anxiety went down to like a three or four because it loses its power 
Yeah. Something so much more powerful and so much more terrifying in your head when you don't know what it is and you can't yeah. work it out. And um, you're spending so much more exerted effort trying to figure out what's going on to the point where another emotion has then become clouded mm. because of you trying to figure out your emotions. Um, and having that time to, yeah, as you said, like have it out and, and just talk it out. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's a third party. Sometimes it's um, writing it down. Yeah. Um, it helps to pick up on the patterns that we do when we're going into these spaces. It helps us to recognize and then it helps us to act based mm. on that, which I think is the most important things that we're doing is that um, action point, taking action, whatever that is, it's small achievable steps down to you. Um, but having that uh, awareness means that we can put plans in place that are potentially going to help yeah. when we're in those really, um, those, having those really strong emotions. Um, hi, Samantha, it's really nice to see you. Um, hello, Jazz and that my, my uh, mood has been dreadful lately and I'm a bit in a bit of a bad way. Um, I'm sorry to hear that, um, Samantha, and um, I hope that this live will be helpful for you today. And I think, um, have you got anything specific that you'd like to ask about emotional regulation? It is on a public page, but if you if you feel comfortable, you can. You're more than welcome to ask any questions. Um, and hopefully, these li the lives that we're doing today is uh, going to help give you some tips and tools potentially that might um, help you with your uh, regulation of mood. Um, yeah. It's, it's so important that um, you're here and thank you for getting here as well. Um, Meg said, um, it's really important to me to realize that there's no wrong emotions um, and they're all a place, they all have their place and are useful to us exactly. Yeah, definitely. 100% and uh, I'll bring that up on the screen uh, with me. Just say hello quickly to Sandy as well. Oh, hi, Sandy. Hope you're well. Sorry, to, um, the <laughs> we've got this new setup, so we can't see it as clearly as we would normally see it. But um, hi, um, Sandy. It's very nice to see you. Um, this comment is so important. I think it's one that definitely needs to be re reflected on. The wrong emotion. We have this. Uh, we get this impression about emotion sometimes, don't we? Yeah, definitely. Um, and mo emotions can change. Emotions can be healthy or unhealthy, but they're not wrong. Yeah. They're there for a purpose. Something I found really useful, actually, to if anyone wants any extra reading, um, there's a book called On Death and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. It was brought out in 1969, mm. and she was like a leading person in her field. And it goes through all the different stages of grieving and the fact that, you know, you've got to kind of go through all these different stages in order to accept it in the end. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about grief, um, and especially in the book, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll, you've lost someone. It could be a loss of who you used to be or a, or a life that you thought you were going to have. Mm. And um, I found the book really interesting because it names all these emotions and says just how normal it is mm. and that everyone will go through all the different stages at different times. Mm. Yeah, and having that, you know, it, those um, that's a really good resource, actually. I think uh, yeah. you've suggested that to me a couple of times about getting that book and I've... Um, gone i'm i don't need it but i think i, I would do I, I think it'd be a good read so thanks for that suggestion it's just a good one to identify mm. different emotions um, it's the identification bit i always go back to that when i'm doing yeah. anything with reg mood is that just having it down writing it down can be so much more it can be it can take as you said take the pressure off of it and it can make it so much more clearer because when it's in our heads and we're trying to figure it out in our heads as mm. we're having that emotion at the same time and the, 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 the symptoms that come with it, so to speak, or the reactions that our body's having because of it, um, it can make that process so much harder. Yeah, definitely. It's down, it's out, it's on paper. I uh, got a message from uh, Janice. Hi there, I'm feeling really bad today. I'm sorry to hear that, Janice. I hope you um, I hope that this live might be of some help um, and know that you can call in if you, if you want to chat. Um, and again, if you've got any questions relating to emotional regulation, please let us know and we can see if we can answer them on the live. Um, but uh, don't be a stranger if you feel that you need to talk to somebody. We are on the phones. Um, we're not personally on the phones right now, <laughs> but we are on the phones um, till five o'clock today. Um, but thank you for getting here today and uh, commenting as well. I think it's so important. The next question we've got, let me get it up, is um, what emotions have you struggled with? Personally. Yeah. I think we're gonna go for a personal route. What emotions? So Nat. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> so what? Um, sorry, I'm just adjusting I feel my like joke. I'm suddenly in a counselling session. Would you like me to uh, <laughs> <laughs> like to address you in an interview style? Um, what emotions have you struggled with? 
Well, my my big one is probably anxiety, mm. and link, linked in with um, my OCD and stress. Yeah, for sure. But once I knew that stress was the trigger, I it it kind of all made sense because I kept going around this cycle. Um, I've had an OCD since I was about eight years old, and it's got worse over certain points of my life. And it took me well into my late twenties till I realised that actually stress was a massive trigger for this, and it was about feeling in control of things. And if I wasn't in control, my OCD would be an absolute nightmare, to be honest. Mm. And um, my OCD would then control my life rather than me control my OCD. So. Mm. Um, and you know, anxiety in general is one of those things that can, it's such a big one for a lot of people. Um, anxiety was certainly one for me. Mm. Um, mine materializing something, it, mine was a more of a social anxiety. Um, and that held me back from like, uh, getting involved with the envi- like the world. Yeah. Um, and being quite fearful of people and, and certainly fearful of change. Change was a massive one for me. Mm. Um, but my mood was um, my mood and my anger were another one that would that would just go up and down so regularly in general. So my like um, depressive spells or hyperactive spells would be quite um, uh, extreme on end to end. So my body didn't know quite how to take it. My brain certainly didn't know how to take it because one minute I'd be um, on the floor and one minute I'd be um, ecstatic, mm. which was quite exhausting. Um, so I think the one the one of the main emotions that I used to struggle with was my anger was one. Mm. Um, I would, and it was more anger and guilt and shame towards myself than it was um, towards uh, other people. Yeah. But I'm I am and I'm still a projector sometimes where I'm angry and I would uh when I'm in that heightened emotion. I'm much mm. better at now, but uh, yeah, everyone has their moments. I think and it's um. It's one of those things where you know anger can grab you quite quickly. So I think anger was mine. Um, but I think in general, to answer that question, I think everything. I think everyone's. I've, I've struggled with all emotions at some point in my mm. life. I'm sure. I think a lot of people have struggled with emotions in their life. I think it's interesting about anger, really, because when we I started learning about anger, I I don't think that I'm a particularly angry person. I don't mm. really. Um, ever confront people or anything like that but there's certain things about anger management like being passive aggressive or sarcastic oh, or yeah. something like that that I didn't kind of really relate to anger and when I started learning about it I thought oh yeah actually maybe maybe I do get angry but just in a different way than what I initially thought. Mm. I think that was probably the main reason I realised I needed anger management when yeah. I was going through the service as a member, um, because uh, I was not an outwardly ang- aggressive person. I wouldn't shout, I wouldn't scream, I wouldn't get violent or anything like that, or that kind of aggressive, physically aggressive. Mm. Um, but that's how I logged it as anger. Yeah. Immediately it was like, bang. That that's that. But I was ex- exceptionally passive aggressive. Yeah. Um, exceptionally uh, angry towards myself, so averting uh, that anger into myself because I didn't feel like I could say it out loud. Yeah. Um, and you get this when you get this when, especially when you do this this job as well. Um, you suddenly realise, oh, I, I need to do some work on that. Oh, that <laughs> oh, actually that relates to me into some respects as well. Yeah. Um, and it's so it's so important. Um, Samantha, so for um, what book is it again? As I may need to get a good book for me to read. I'm still grieving. Um, and my nan and granddad, it's only been a few months. Okay, so it's um, On Death and Dying, and it's Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Hmm. And um, for those who might who might need to hear it again, um, you can always uh, go back to it at the end. So if um, you haven't been able to catch the name, you can like rewind at the end of the live, and you should be able to hopefully get the name. Um or um, I can get you to write it on a piece of paper and hold it up because <laughs> it's a, it's one of those. Th- but it will be backwards though, so you have to write it backwards. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> um, I'll give that a go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roland said, "Hi, Roland." Um, Roland says, "Nat, you nailed it." Ah, okay. it's nice to see you. So uh, let's. It is nice to see you. Sorry, I thought. Um, let's go on to the next question. I feel like I can't control my. Feelings. 
bad thing. I think it's a natural thing, isn't mm. it? I don't think it's a bad thing. And that I mean, I don't I certainly don't think it's a bad thing. Um, I think where so yeah, as you said, it, it can happen sometimes. I think in general, if you feel like your feelings are going up and down and up and down and up and down all the time, mm. it's not so that it's bad. It might be something that you want to work on to help regulate and make that a little bit more of a smooth process, so to speak. If your moods are going like this, and they're supposed to more really be like that, mm. um, it, I think it's about asking yourself if that's continuous and it's not related to a situation or something going on or something like that, that might be something that you might want to address if you if it's something that you're finding difficult. Um, it also depends, doesn't it, how much it, it's affecting you. So what I mean by that is mm. if um, I know that some of you guys would have heard this in the workshop, but if a local fisherman um, is scared of flying mm. and has uh, a phobia of flying and that would make him really anxious, but he does, he, he only goes on holiday, got something to really worry about if that was part of your job and that affected your job then it might be something you wanted to work on yeah and also frequency as well and this this has definitely been one that I've gauged my OCD on over the years is um how often it's happening mm. so how often am I having the really bad spells that makes a huge difference. If it is happening too many times throughout the day that my anxiety is high, then that's something I need to work on. Yeah, it's, it's having that awareness in yourself, isn't it? And as you said, if you're, um, if you're not a pilot and you don't go on a plane that often, then it might not be something you want to work on in terms of, you know, your fear of flying. Um, and that does go back to things like, uh, and it's also, it's really important that we take into account um, if it's situational, and what I mean by situation, if it's if it's an, a reaction to something that's happened and mm. an experience that's happened, um, if you're having a really hard time controlling your feelings because something's happened, like you've lost somebody or you're going through a recent loss or a bereavement or a big life change, like you've, uh, a job change or a house, even if these things are positive, they can still affect your emotions. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's about having that a view on it of actually, you know, when anybody is going through something, going through a change, going through a loss, going through something that might be really sad or on the flip side can be really happy as well. We can lose the regulation of our emotions yeah. because we're processing them. If, if we're giving ourselves some chance to process our emotions and um, allowing ourselves to feel those emotions, um, the control will naturally, I guess, go back. It will kind of... Yeah, work itself work out. Work itself out. Um, and that way it, it shows that there's you've got that healthy relationship with the emotions and saying, actually, I, I, um, I'm i allowed to not feel great sometimes. Yeah. I'm allowed to have um, mood swings and moments of um, uh, moments in my life, in general, moments of like strong emotion. Mm. Um, and that's okay. Um, not, yeah. not beating yourself up about it. It's mm. a huge thing. Um, accepting and allowing yourself to feel the emotions will definitely um, help you to move through them um, in a more healthy and probably a quicker way in the end mm. because you're not beating yourself up about feeling them just you know I read somewhere the other day about moving through the emotions rather than trying to get rid of them mm. entirely yeah. I am uh, um... And there's some areas that your emotions might be different to others. And actually, mm. that's a really good thing. Mm. Um, for, I'm quite, um, as you well know now, because you sit next to me in the office, I'm quite a hyperactive person. Quite an excitable... Only a little bit. A, a little bit. And when I a really lot. enjoy something, <laughs> when I really enjoy something like new post-it notes, my excitement level goes from stationary to... I've won a trophy. I've won an Olympic gold medal. They just shoot. I get very excited. Um, I used to really attack myself for that. And I used to think that I had poor emotional regulation because I got hyperactive very quickly. But mm. I'm an excitable person. I enjoy things. And actually, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, and even if people say that that's an emotional regulation thing, I'm happy. Um, it's not affecting me, not affecting anyone else. And actually, I'm allowed to feel emotions in a way and I'm allowed to express emotions in a way that... Um, I can relate to. 
Yeah. Because they're my emotions. So um, it, that is one of those things about emotional regulation is um, they're your emotions and they're valid and they're right. Um, yeah. You can change the ones that you want to change um, and things that are affecting you and on a day-to-day basis, like you said. Um, and, it, and that's absolutely fine too. Yeah, and also, if you can't control your feelings, there's other ways of tackling it, isn't there? So mm. we briefly discussed about removing the trigger, which mm. which you can do sometimes, but this has come up quite a lot with um, some of the people we work with, with OCD, including myself, that um, anything can be a trigger, so you can't remove it. I can tackle the evaluation process and give myself some time and space to let the rational brain kick in rather mm. than the panicked brain. Um, and if not, you and if you still can't control your feelings, it's not a bad thing. You can control your behaviour and how you react to it. So you can take yourself off, you know, especially when you're talking about stuff like anger, you might end up doing something you're going to be embarrassed about later, you're going to feel mm. shameful, it's not going to serve any good, is it? So it'd be better then just to go, right, I am angry, but I'm not going to react to it mm. and just cut it out that way. Still feel the emotion, but react to it a different way. There's um, something we um, I've discussed in uh, a previous impulse control live, a live around impulse control. And one of the things that comes re- it comes a lot into emotional regulation is impulse control sometimes. Um, and one of the um, terms is like there's when you're in a heightened emotion, there might be the reaction before the thought stage in the middle. Mm. And that is exactly what you said, it's getting that buffer. Because mm. sometimes you can't remove a trigger and sometimes the timing just, you can't change the timing. You have to act on something um, or your emotions are, are really heightened that you can't really see those lines. Mm. Um, and then adding the buffer element and saying, okay, there's something called the half an hour rule. And it's really good in um, ADHD and things like that, which is my background. And um, it's it's saying, okay, if we come away from emotions into like shopping, I don't know. If you're an impulsive shopper, you if you leave half an hour, at least half an hour between you know the mm. action um, and actually purchasing it or thinking about purchasing it or making a, a plan for it, um, it can then help to decipher, is this something I actually want or is this something my impulsive brain is going, or my um, emotional brain is going, I need it or I want it, mm. um, or I need to act or I need to react. Um, it actually works with OCD as well mm. because, um, for example, one of my things is washing my hands, and it always has been. Mm. Um, it's something I can't quite break out of, but I just manage it. Mm. Um, but I try and put space in between how many times I wash my hands. Mm. So if something happens, I'll say, right, I'll wait 20 minutes and then wash my hands. And yeah, it's difficult sometimes, it's playing on your brain, but you're almost retraining your brain that it's okay and that you survived. Mm. So that next time it happens, the anxiety is not gonna be as high. We go back into that, um, we always talk about making healthy new experiences, don't we? Yeah. And um, celebrating those experiences. And then talking about celebrating experiences, we've got a message at the top from Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey. I hope you're well. Um, and and he says, hello, ladies. It's been um, 102 days today being without alcohol. With no Brilliant. Alcohol. Um, non-alcoholic. That's fantastic, Jeffrey. And um, a massive congratulations. It takes so much power and so much strength and resilience to yeah. um, come away from um, an addiction or to... Um, become abstinent on alcohol and things like mm. that. So a massive congratulations and I hope you're doing really well and I hope you're feeling a lot better and yeah. celebrating that success. Um, celebrate it day by day. Celebrate the little things that we do. Yeah, you, definitely. And um, um, I'm so That's glad. That's helping that. build new new experiences. experiences, there you go. isn't it? Um, and uh, Megan replied to um, Samantha, Samantha and, and said, hormonal changes can make a, ro- um, a regulation so difficult. I hear you. Um, I think that's why for me it's so important to have a good amount of tools in the toolbox as mm-hmm. a baseline so that when biological aspects have an impact, it's easier to manage. Definitely difficult, though. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Um, they t- we talk about the different reasons why people can have mood. Uh, the biopsychosocial model and things like that. And um, 
sometimes our body, a physiological side of our, like our emotions, our hormones, and these uh, different elements. Mm. Um, health is another one. A physical health can have a massive um, pain, can have a yeah. massive link on our emotional regulation. And um, having a good toolbox of things to do that might work in some areas that might not work in others, it helps to um, find the mechanisms, the coping mechanisms that are going to work for you in that situation, or at least are going to help alleviate it slightly yeah. until the feelings have passed or until you're able to reach out for somebody or reach out for help or um, talk to somebody. I think hormonal change is a massive one and um, completely identify with that, Samantha. Mm. And what I tend to do, and it's just me personally, is I go back to um, my basic human needs um especially when it's that time of the month um i know that i need to keep my water up i need to make sure that i'm getting my vitamins and my minerals and um, to keep my mood lifted and even though it's sometimes the last thing i want to do in the, in the world is i need to go and do some exercise mm. and whether that's like 10 minutes 15 minute walk in fresh air you know it it still lifts my mood yeah. and there's I always go back to the physical element. Hmm. Um, hi, oh. Sarah. I hope you're well. Hey. How are you doing today? And we've got all our rainbows. Got all of our rainbow hearts, which is fantastic. It's hi, amazing. Sarah. Um, so let's go on to the next question. We've got, um, how can I get rid of my emotions? I think can't get rid of them. Yeah, <laughs> we covered this quite quickly. We can't get rid of them. And actually, um, you, I... It, you, want you don't to. want to. Uh, no. I, I hope you don't robot, want to. Wouldn't you? Um, it could be. Sorry, I'm trying to fix the chat. It's um, emotions are a, a really positive thing. Yeah. And they can be such a positive thing. And actually, getting rid of emotions altogether could. Um, it's not might not do us all, all all that good. Well, if you look at if you, I know a lot of people say with emotional regulation that um, they lack motivation, but mm. emotions can motivate us as well. Yeah, Mo motivate us for change, motivate us to do something that we've enjoyed in the past. Mm. It builds social connections because without emotions, we would be unfeeling, wouldn't we? Yes. Sorry. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so easily distracted. What's what's <laughs> Sandy put there? Uh, Zanny's, but I agree. I have learnt to take time out before I um, react. If you don't have to react straight away, oh, that is that is yeah, so important. Perfect. Um, and having that, taking that time out between it is is really important. I apologise. My mic was muted for a second while I try to adjust um, the angle because I do. I am a fidgeter, aren't I? Um, Samantha said, "Defo, it's so difficult um, to give up um, a." To give up my job, up the job, as I'm not coping due to my health, um, but I'm going to go back to swimming and doing my badminton with my friends. It helps my mood. Oh, perfect. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that exercise element. Yeah. It, is, it comes in so much into um, emotional regulation. It helps to give you the good chemicals, the serotonin, the dopamine. So if you are um, more prone to the lower side of um, emotional regulation, your depressions, your low moods and things like that, um, Obviously, we're going to, um, we would exercise is one of those things that's so, it's really helpful. It's not the only thing. We're no. not suggesting that if you go for a run, you'll be completely cured because um, I have a feeling we'd get some comments back from that. But um, <laughs> it does help to the, it does help with that regulation. It does help with also that distraction as well. Mm. Um, and it gives you that space to clear your head. Um, and obviously, if you have some mobility issues, something that does stop you from doing exercises, there's other types of exercises that aren't just um, cardio or running or something that's uh, going to get your heart rate too far up. There's things like sitting exercises, yoga. There's things like... Um, and, and exercising your brain as well. We spoke about this, didn't we? Mental activity. Mental activity. Um, I used to play a lot of chess. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to joke about the fact that chess is defined as a sport. And actually, it is quite taxing. It is yeah. quite physically taxing because you are having to think so logically that it does exercise your brain, um, which is fantastic and is exactly what you need. Um, I have, We've got a lot of comments. Let me just scroll the back up. Uh, Roland says, my emotions define me. Yep. And I think that's that. That I think emotions define us all, don't they? Like uh, the way we live, our personalities are... Yeah, what we like, what yeah. we don't like, who we like, who we don't like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and what we give our attention to. Yeah. What we motivate ourselves to do. Definitely. And um, 
as you said, motivation has a huge element in any kind of work we do. And, and motivation is fueled by, um, it can be fueled by our logical reasoning, but it is fueled by our emotions as well. Yeah. We're more likely to do something if we're interested in it or if we are invested in it in order to better ourselves or to commit ourselves to something. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah asks, how are we? And sorry. Good, Le- thank you. Um, I'm good as well. Thank you very much. And um, Kirsty, hi, Kirsty. I'm late. Hello, Kirsty. This is a drop in. Don't worry uh, too much if you're late and you can watch it back on demand after this live is over if you'd like. Um, <laughs> um, uh, she sounds like an advert, doesn't she, Kirsty? Uh, I know. <laughs> I know. When I get in front of one of these kind of microphones, I can quickly you don't turn want to into be anywhere a... near her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. This is fantastic. This is great. Um, amazing idea it is so good to uh focus on things we can do to help ourselves when there's things bringing us down that we can't control bringing the good things back into our lives definitely helps lift us up yeah definitely that is one really really good point megan and it's it leads us quite quickly on to talking about um the distraction techniques i give we give ourselves yeah um i think it's so important that if you are at either end if you're really really high or really, really low on your mood, um, and you are struggling to regulate that, struggling to get that back down, um, sometimes people can try and find the cause, want to find the cause of it too quickly. Yeah. When you're in those really like acute, well, call them acute stages, but really high intensity um, moods, mm. um, it's really important. The first thing that we do isn't to figure out, necessarily figure out the cause of why these moods are higher yeah. or lower. Um, it's actually to distract ourselves to a point where we can regulate them just a little bit. And also bring... get the oxygen and everything like Absolutely. that into you. Yeah. Because quite often we're like holding our breath when mm. we're really angry or anxious or... Take care of our core needs, mm-hmm. um, distract ourselves to be able to help us regulate, get ourselves back down to a, not necessarily uh, completely balanced, but to a point where our brains can rationalize. Mm. When we're at either end, it can be very difficult to rationalize and um, it can be quite easy to take a thought that we're having and catastrophize it or to find something to suggest that um, the negative things we're thinking about ourselves, for example, are true or... Um, or even sometimes, hmm. like you said, like you were you were saying previously, that sometimes you're in such a heightened emotion that all you can do is distract yourself because otherwise you're going to stick in that. And what hmm. I mean by that, I suppose, is when I have um, like really bad OCD spells and I'm saying checking the door, checking the door, checking the door, it's like hmm. a broken record. The best thing I can do is cut off that broken record so even and i learned this a long time ago even turning around on the spot or just walking off and then coming back to check it is enough time to break that like broken record in Mm. your head that scratch record going over and over and over yeah it's um it's one of those things that's um when it's coming to kind of breaking a cycle mm. almost like if you've got yourself into a loop a thought loop and your brain's just going no 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 it can be very difficult to break out of that um just need the distraction you need to distract a yourself. physical one yeah like uh, i mean that's why uh we tend to almost forget about what's going on when we're doing something we enjoy yeah. um and a distraction is supposed to be something that we enjoy or something that is good for us um so if, if your distraction is going for a run or if your distraction is watching the chase, I get very emotional at the chase. But it, it makes me... Um, I think that would wind me up more, the chase. I can't watch TV shows like that. Can you not? No. I see, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very emotionally regulated when I watch the chase because I feel like I'm... Um, you know when you're looking out of a window yeah. in a car and you've got music on and you, you somehow feel that you're in a music video? Mm. I'm like that on the chase. For some reason, I'm just imagining myself there answering the questions, knowing okay. that I'm not going to do very Fair well. Um, but it's um, it's a it's a happy place for me. But everyone's got their own happy place. It scares me. Um, I don't think my overall happy place, my happiest place, is sat on the chase. I think that might be a little <laughs> bit too stressful. But um, in general, is finding that happy space, that that place that we can distract ourselves to, to get to a point where we can then um, get a better handle of what's going yeah. on, and then think it, then figure it out later. Yeah, exactly. I do crosswords. Yes, crosswords are a really good one. 
and we've had many discussion of crosswords in Downton Abbey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, the next question is, why do I struggle to manage my mood? There's a few, there's few links into this. There's a few, there's, there, it's, it's different for every person. I yeah. Think. Like you touched upon with the biopsychosocial model, mm. it could be it could be that um, bad th- a lot of bad things have happened when you've grown up, and because of that, you've only got bad things as a reference point in your brain. Mm. Um, it could be like we've already mentioned before. I think it was Samantha who said about hormones. Um, it could be, you know, although that there there is not one depressive gene. It could be that your brain chemicals that you know you've inherited mm. um, are l- lower than other people's, and you need to work a little bit harder to bring the chemicals up. It could be loads of things. Yeah, and also things like the practical things we do. If we aren't getting enough exercise, yeah. if we're not sleeping, I mean, yeah. sleeping is a huge one, isn't it? Yeah, that has a massive link towards the way we regulate our emotion, not only just because we're grouchy if we don't sleep or if we sleep too much, but also it, it we don't have enough adequate time to really process our, the day before and then to kind of process what's going on um, and to re-regulate ourselves in our sleep and um, have that rest that we need. Um, eating is another one. Yeah, I find that I'm. it's much harder for me to regulate my emotions if I've had um, something like a lot of sugar. Yeah. Or a lot of um, something, or fast food, because my body is being nutrienced. Nope, my <laughs> body isn't being. Um, <laughs> isn't what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. It's not being. I'm not being nutritious, and my body's not being. You're not uh, giving your body the nutrition it needs. That's what I was looking for. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, and situations like emotions, triggers, all these kind of things that happen in the psychological and the sociological module, uh, the areas of things as well. Mm. Uh, nourished, that's what I was looking for. Thank you, Megan. Ah, <laughs> um, as Sarah said it as well. <laughs> yeah, we got nour- um, it's going to turn into Jazz is trying to learn how to speak English again. Um, it's one of those things well, that... It's, it's 10 minutes too, so it's... of course you're going to stop speaking English. Ah, well, it's If it. anyone hasn't met Jazz before, this is just, this just is getting used to it yeah so, <laughs> um sarah said i'm concentrating on my um basic needs because by doing that ultimately everything will fall into place naturally yeah that's the plan for me as it's worked for me in the past yeah the yeah. basic needs your basic Definitely. needs are so important um, i used to be really defensive when someone suggested to me that because i hadn't slept in two days that might be having a problem with my emo- mental health because mm-hmm. i used to think that it was invalidating almost that um I, I used to think my mental health was purely related to my past experiences, yeah. to my traumas, to my diagnosis. But actually, um, things like not drinking enough water, uh, drinking out a lot of alcohol, in my case, it was drugs as well, um, not sleeping at all, or sleeping too much, or not eating well, have a massive effect on our mood. Or at Sleep's least have. a huge one. Sleep is a massive one. And um, emotional regulation in, in food is really important as well. Yeah. Uh, I find when. As I said, when I've not had the right f- nourishing food to nourish my body, there we go. The, um, she got there in the end. I got there in the end. It's fine. It, it, it really does. Aff- um, you see it a lot, don't you? That's yeah. What sugar is a huge one. Well, it, the the thing with um, sleep, just going back to that briefly, is that quite a lot of um, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, everyone kind of would advise you focus on getting a regular sleep routine before you try and work on anything else. Mm. Because a lot of things can um, seem better, not brilliant, I'm not saying it's the only thing, Mm. but seem better once you've had a good night's sleep. And I know that's so difficult for a lot of people, Mm. um, the sleep, but whatever sleep looks like to you, whatever good night's sleep looks like to you, it's really important you get it and then you can tackle the other things afterwards. Mm. Um, Kirsty's asked a really good question. How would you apply that um, at night when you're trying to sleep? I don't want to go for a run and leave my kid at home at midnight. And why not, Kirsty? <laughs> What's the <laughs> matter with that? that? Question, <laughs> right? um, there's because uh, I get really active at night time. Um, my brain starts getting really active, so I have to do exercises. But I live with five other people, mm. um, so I googled, uh, put into YouTube. Um, low impact 
like um, apartment workouts and they're built for people who can't make no, no or no noise workouts like quiet workouts mm. um which are more related to getting our blood pumping and getting ourselves having exercise but at the same time are um kind of relieving that energy and getting your your heart going without the noise um yeah obviously if you're planning to try and sleep obviously with it being in the middle of the night um exercise can also stop us sleeping it can yeah. wake us up again and so things like a good one meditation yoga things that are going to give us that slow release mm. and get us into sleep um can be really helpful or mental uh, uh, reading yeah something that's long, no low stimulant like um not like on the phone uh, or um mm. watching something with a screen but something that's still going to um, get you off into a night's sleep might be a good way about it. Um, I do a Sudoku. Yeah, Sudokus are quite good. I haven't quite patterns. Out, haven't quite out, worked out the number part of it yet, and that's the entire puzzle. But I'll <laughs> you get. You just been fit colouring in the squares. I've been just putting the numbers that <laughs> are missing in, in each one. <laughs> Not worry. Just anywhere. Though. Anywhere. This is how it works. There's isn't a fault. There isn't a fault there, so I just put it there. Um, down to uh, and another question um, is just seems counterproductive uh, to use distraction techniques whilst trying to get a decent night's sleep. Just feeling overwhelmed um, with what I should actually be doing. Um, one of the core areas with sleep, especially with lack of sleep, if you're really struggling to sleep um, and your brain is going, I need sleep, I need sleep, you're not you're not going to sleep. No. So sometimes getting a distraction in or will just get up to just get up. Uh, go and get a cuppa, do something that's um, going to distract you from that feeling mm. does help to then process it out. Because um, if, you if you're awake because of an emotion, yet you're trying to get to sleep at the same time, your brain is going to be fighting against figuring out what's going on in your head and figuring out how to sleep. Um, and again, when we're thinking about wanting to do something or thinking about the fact that we're not doing something, we can fix on it. Mm. And that can keep us awake longer. Like uh, if you are car sick, for example, and you're in a car thinking, oh, I'm, I'm car sick, I'm going to feel sick. You're more likely to feel sick to as a sick, result. Because yeah. um, you're concentrating on it. Because you're concentrating on it. And sometimes the act is actually getting, that, moving and concentrating on something else, uh, which does seem really counterproductive. I but it just, actually does help. I was just going to say to Kirsty that like, um, I used to really struggle I'm um, getting off to sleep because my, it's for some reason that was when my anxiety and my OCD was like at its very worst. Um, and I'd quite often wake up at like three or four o'clock in the morning, like really bang awake. Mm. And um, I, what I started doing, and I know this is just going to sound really silly, but uh, I'm sure you've heard it before. I started keeping a pad and a pen by my bed and I'd bullet point all the things I needed to do. Mm. And for some reason, it worked. I'm, I'm sure it won't work for everyone, but I was awake and I was like, I've got to do this tomorrow, I've got to do that. Have I done this? I didn't check this before I left, blah, 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 blah. This is when I was managing pubs. And I, just having that notepad, so I'd get up, bang awake, four o'clock in the morning, jot down a list of stuff to do. Mm. And then within about half an hour, 45 minutes, I was able to go back to sleep again. Mm. And that was really important for me. I couldn't go to work at four o'clock in the morning yeah. because I would have still been there at one o'clock the, the following day. Yeah. And you touched on a point there, Kirsty, about an element that you can't control and that's your, um, your responsibilities with your yeah. kid. You can't control when your kid's gonna wake up and cry and, and need your attention and, um, Obviously, there's things you can do and put in place that might help that in 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 a way, and it might um, remedy itself in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there are elements you can't control in, in terms of um, when your kid's going to wake up. What you can control is the, are the things that you can, and even by saying okay, reminding yourself that's something I can't necessarily control. Doesn't mean yeah. it, it doesn't mean it's not tiring. Doesn't mean it's not frustrating. It doesn't mean it's not um, exhausting. I know um, my friends just had a baby and um, she is absolutely knackered all the time because she's waking up all the time for a, a youngster. Um, and it, it, it can be an exhausting part of um, yeah, parenthood, definitely. having to wake up in the middle of the night, but reminding yourself that you are doing the best that you possibly can. And it's okay to feel grumpy and frustrated by it. There's mm -hmm. no shame in that. Um, it's not something you necessarily, but if you're telling yourself, I can't actually control this, it does help take the pressure to fix it away. Um, and it helps you to then focus on areas that, you know, might be 
um, might be more helpful at that moment. Um, moving, uh, but if you do need to have a chat, of course, anybody who's a member with us, if you do need to talk to us, please give us a call between nine and five because we're happy to chat, aren't we? Yeah. Or anyone in the duty team are happy to chat um, about things going forward with you. Um, one question that we want to end on, and there's two questions that are linked with this. It's how can I control my feelings? And there's another one underneath it. It's what can I do when I'm stressed? Um, and controlling your feelings. Well, um, we've touched on this we've almost touched all the way through. All well, the way through. Um, if we look at stress quickly, because I think stress is one thing um, that we can talk about specifically. It, it's, it's If you're in a point where you're able to figure out what the stress is, Mm. Um, it it's, might be that you move away from that situation if it's something that you can't get away from like I don't know work or you know something that's um, it's um, it's going to support yeah you know it's going to give you that uh, anything that's going to give you that distraction if mm -hmm. you can't figure out what's going on can be really helpful if you've figured out what's going on and you can remove yourself from that situation get yourself some rest take it easy if it's an action you're trying to do Break it down. Yeah, definitely break it mm. down. One thing that I've done recently, and it's been really beneficial for me, for the first time ever, I've had a self-care journal. And that is because I've had notebooks for work. I have notebooks for things that I've got to do outside of my life, like all of my therapy training. So I've got to read this. I've got to write this essay. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And I thought, when I started the, my new course, I thought I'm going to do things differently this mm. time. And I've got a self-care journal. And that is because the first thing that I always manage to get all of the things that I have to do done, and then I forget to look after myself, and then I get stressed. Mm. Because I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm not getting my basic human needs met, so I'm not eating properly. I'm not drinking enough water. I'm not having enough social interaction. I'm not having enough fun. The self-care journal that I bought is amazing because it actually says, what am I going to listen to this week? What am I going to read this week? Um, how much social interaction time I've had? Two things that I'm looking forward to doing this week. And it, and it prompts you to say stuff that's not work-related. It's not a to-do list. Like, mm. I've got to do the washing. I've got to go shopping. I've got to do this. It's specifically what is going to make you happy this week and finding me time. And do you know what? It's working. Yeah. Writing it down. That's the one thing in any medium that it works for you. Self-care journals. Yeah. Um, I know that a lot of, over lockdown, there was ones in Aldi that were really helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. That's uh, the one I got. That's the one you've got. It's cheap. Um, there's it's dirt cheap. Yeah, there's some dirt cheap ones. There's some ones you can get on Amazon that are quite cheap as well. Uh, but also you can make your own through bullet journals or writing things into it into a notebook. Mm. Self-care, writing things down. They're two elements that are so important when controlling mood and regulating stress is that um, if you are writing things down, you're more likely to pick up on patterns. You're more likely to be able to get it external, look at it from another perspective. The stop technique, stop with two Ps. Yeah. Stop, take a break, um, take a breath, not take a break. Um, <laughs> observe, uh, put in perspective and proceed. The put in perspective bit is so important. It's seeing it from a helicopter view. Yeah. Uh, so have a look at that online. Um, also... Talking to people is another one. Being open about it and, and being honest about it can be r really, really helpful. Um, and I know there was a question around who to talk to out of hours. Obviously, you've got the crisis team or what the, what's now called the Integrated Mental Health Hub who are out of hours. Uh, there's also um, NHS 111 uh, have a mental health team 20, um, in their uh, area. Uh, Safe Haven work till 10 o'clock. Um, and they're really good. They're run by two saints. Um, and also... Uh, you've got Samaritans, Shout, who are who are out of hours as Samaritans well. Samaritans really good. Samaritans are really yeah. good. Uh, if you just want someone to listen and and, and um, have you feel that you're heard, um, yeah. they can be just exactly what you need at that moment. Um, and of course, um, in our services, if you're under any services, your GP, if you're under Zeropia, us, um, mm. and uh, most GPs have mental health practitioners now, so it's so important. Um, I've just realised we've now hit the hour. I'm just going to quickly say to Sarah, for it. Sarah, it's from Aldi and it was 2 99 but mm. I think they do them in Lidl as well. 
self-care has become a <laughs> massive thing over lockdown, hasn't it? So a lot of these journals now are becoming... Love it. Um, they come with stickers. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they'll have them in things like the works and the range and things like that um, as well. Uh, there's lots of self-care journals out there and hopefully you'll find one that's going to work. Um, so we've come to the end of the hour somehow. We have indeed. Um, thank you very much for everybody who um, joined us. Of course, we might not have been able to get to your questions. Really sorry about that. The the, the chat moves very, very quickly, very, very quickly. Um, and um, what we're going to be doing is um, coming back to you, is it next week we're back? Mm -hmm. So we'll um, usually most Fridays um, at 1pm till 2. Um, I hope you have a fantastic week. If you feel that you'd benefit from the support that we have here at Isaropia, please find out more with our website. It's isaropia.uk. Um, and for referrals, we've got isaropia.uk forward slash referrals. Um, and you can find out how we can accept referrals through there. Yeah. Um, you can get uh, referred through your GP. If you're under a mental health service on the Isle of Wight already, you can get referred through most of your mental health services directly to us. So it, it can be that you might have a conversation about that. But if you do need support um, out of hours for the Isle of Wight. The number is 01983 or you can use 111 um, and or Safe Haven as well, uh, which is based on the Isle of Wight. So, uh, with that being said, have a brilliant week, everybody. Uh, weekend. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's lovely weather out there. It's been a pleasure um, having this live today. It's and lovely weather. Have it's you not been outside? <laughs> no, I like not. the rain. This is oh, the problem. Okay, I'm a, yeah, I'm a fan nice. of the rain. <laughs> Um, I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Yeah, have um, a great weekend, guys. And get involved, and I hope to see you soon. See you soon. Take care now. Bye. Bye, everybody. Toodles.